one of Sonoma's pioneering Chardonnay producers moves on to Pinot Noir. Find out more in this episode of The Honest Pour. Welcome to The Honest Pour with John Lennart, where we go beyond the bottle to connect you with the people and places that make each wine so unique. All right, I admit it. I'm a freak about Pinot Noir. Fruity, earthy, sometimes a bit funky, and almost always perfect with food. These are just a few of the reasons people can't get enough of it. Emeritus Vineyards, in Sonoma's Russian River Valley, was founded by Bryce Couture Jones, former fighter pilot and founder of the popular Chardonnay producer, Sonoma Couture. After selling Sonoma Couture, Jones devoted his skills to that other Burgundian grape, Pinot Noir. I sat down with his daughter, Mari Jones, at Formentos, 925 West Randolph in Chicago, to talk about Emeritus Vineyards and to taste their single vineyard wines. Joining me today is Mari Jones of Emeritus Vineyards. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So tell me what you do at Emeritus. So uh, I do a little bit of everything. My main job is uh, keeping my father in line. Uh, he started Emeritus. He's Bryce Jones. Um, but we work together to um, make the best Pinot Noir that we possibly can from our vineyard. So we have a great team that Bryce has been working with for about 35 years. And I'm a newer addition to the team. And we, we work together to get our wine out there to put it in the hands of people who love Pinot Noir. And yeah, so I, I run our tasting room at the winery. We just opened a new tasting room there, travel around doing dinners and sharing our wine with people like you. And what's your title? President of Fun. <laughs> what, is the pre- what, what, what does that mean? What is the President of Fun? Anything that's fun. Anything like this, you know? I do wine dinners. I do pouring events. I host people at the winery. I give tours and um, share our wines there. So anything that is enjoyable, which is pretty much anything in the wine industry. but That's great. Yeah. And your dad is Bryce Couture Jones yep. from, from Sonoma Couture. Yes. And before that, uh, Air Force fighter pilot. Exactly. I mean, what was like growing up with uh, Bryce as a dad? Well, probably a better question to ask him what it was like growing up with me, <laughs> because I was definitely a sassy daughter. Uh, I'm the only daughter, the youngest of three children. And, you know, we gave Bryce as hard of a time as any other kids do. I never liked his Chardonnay. I would tell him that all the time. I never drank his Chardonnay. I drank it. I didn't love to drink it. I preferred to drink his red burgundies that he was collecting. And it was just fun, though. You know, he'd take us up to the vineyard and just, you know, go to work with dad for the day. And for us, it would be learning to drive the Jeep on the vineyard or, uh, for me, almost driving it into the reservoir (laughs) or (laughs) camping and finding, you know, six foot rattlesnake skins and then deciding to sleep in the car. You know, it was all that kind of fun stuff. There wasn't, you know, it didn't feel out of the ordinary. It was just, uh, just dad. So you grew up tasting wine at a young age then, huh? Yes. uh, The rule was when you could hold a glass, you could have a diluted glass of wine with dinner. Only with dinner and only one glass. It's very Italian. Yeah. yeah. And so from a young age, whenever I could hold a glass, six or whatever, it was an option every night to have wine. I didn't have wine every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, most often the wine that was served was the McTrayer. And like I said, I just never cared for it. It was never my taste. And when I was 12, I went with my dad on a barrel and tree vine trip in Burgundy and in France. And that was where I first really tasted undiluted wine and really high quality, you know, so I immediately was drawn to it. And I said, Bryce, you got to start making wine like this. And I, from then on, I would only drink red wine. <laughs> That's really, I mean, here's this 12 year old kid in, in Burgundy, <laughs> I know. Right? Drinking, drinking wine, you know. If I had I'm, only known then what I know now. <laughs> right. You really appreciated it much more, yeah. huh? Here's this kid, this 12 year old kid in, in Burgundy. And Burgundy is... Well, it's light and approachable. It yep. could be funky yeah, and not fruity. You know, not that fruity kind of sweetness. Yep. You you think a kid maybe would be more into like a like a like a California Zinfandel, right? You know, right. Kind yeah. of it's jammy juice, and extracted. Right? Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> what was it like tasting these burgundies as a twelve year old? Looking back at it from your perspective now. <laughs> from my perspective now, I just want to slap myself and say you were such a brat. But at the time, what really stood out to me was the history and the people and the connection to the vineyards, but but really the history and the we go down into a cellar and told all these stories about how soldiers were hiding there during the French Revolution and oh here are some of the bottles that they would have been making at that time or drinking at that time. And to me that just really blew me away that not only the just depth and like breadth of history, which we don't quite have in our country, but the wine being there as, you know, kind of just 
this part of everything. It was always there. It was always around. It was always part of the culture. And that stood out to me, I think, more than the particular tastes of the wines was really the experience of being in those just centuries old cellars and being underground and, um, you know, meeting people who I now look back at like, oh my gosh, you met those people. Right. And- <laughs> like, like, like you met, was your dad's business partner for a while Aubert, was Aubert, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aubert de Valaine of Domaine Romani County. Yep, and um, I stayed in Anclade Lefebvre's house and I went to school with her daughters and I had no idea, you know, it was just, oh, stay here for a couple of days while I go and do work. And so it was, okay, I'm going to French school for a couple of days. And, you know, just no idea, which is totally okay. You know, I was 12 and what 12 year olds don't care who's important in the wine industry. But what was it, that whole kind of cultural experience of seeing wine and the history and all that depth was, I think, what really stood out to me. Um, and then also kind of discovering that there was wine other than Sonoma Couture, <laughs> that I actually liked wine. <laughs> sure. So, and your dad, for a while, was in business with Aubert, yep. and he would come to the U.S. Yeah. What, was, what was that like, like, having this, literally, this legend in wine coming over your house? When, when he came over, was it like, were you preparing for, like, royalty to come, or was it like, oh, oh Uncle Aubert is coming? Um, you know, for my mom, my mom is a fantastic, fantastic cook, and she would make just unbelievable meals for him, which I've been a vegetarian like my whole life. So I would never eat, you know, whatever she was cooking. But, you know, it was just like, uh, dad's friend is coming over. I remember one time he walked in, I have children brothers. So I was, you know, probably around nine or 10 at this point. And um, Aubert walks in and my older brother is, you know, around 14. He says, oh, uh, hey, Aubert, do you want to play a game? He goes, oh, okay, sure. He says, it's called 52 card pickup. Oh, no. <laughs> and you could just see my dad going, no. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing, Victor? And he just takes his deck of cards and throws it everywhere. And he says, okay, pick it up. <laughs> and Aubert did not pick them up, but <laughs> Bryce immediately shuffled him off in horror and said, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. My children are such American brats. That's very funny. But, you know, for us, it was, it, it was Bryce's friend Aubert. It was like. You know, Bryce's friend Jim. It was no different. And did you learn anything about the wine business? Uh, were there any big takeaways like yeah. that you, know, you still use today? The biggest takeaway that we use kind of as a company and that really informs us at Emeritus um, is when Bryce actually was buying Aubert out of this partnership and was saying, you know, basically, this is too expensive, Aubert. I want to keep you as a friend. We don't have an irrigation system. This vineyard is not going to be what we thought it was going to be, or at least it's going to be what we thought it would be, but with a lot more money. Bear said, well, you don't need an irrigation system, Bryce. That's, you just don't need one. You don't need to water the vines. And it was that conversation with Aubert that spurred us into dry farming. And that's why we really went down the path to experiment and try to get to dry farming, which we are now. We'll get back to dry yeah. farming in a minute. I want to know a little bit about Emeritus first, yeah. uh, sort of bigger picture. Tell me about Emeritus. What, what's the idea behind it? Emeritus is all Pinot Noir, so kind of a singular focus. But within that, we're all estate bottled, so we've developed all of our own vineyard, farm everything ourselves. And everything that we do is vineyard specific, or even we do a couple really small block specific bottlings as well. So we're really focusing on the unique terroirs that we're getting from our different vineyards. All of our vineyards have this, have a similar soil, but other than that, they're, they all have a lot of different expressions based on the land, the climate. So we're really trying to tease out all of those. Uh, unique properties and uh, showcase what we think are some of the greatest, you know, vineyards for Pinot Noir. Where's the winery? The winery is in Sebastopol. We are farming about 140 acres in Sebastopol on two different vineyards, one being Hallberg Ranch, which is our flagship wine. You'll find that in restaurants and kind of around the country. Then we also have a smaller property, Pinot Hill, in Sebastopol, which is about 30 acres. And is that all Russian River there? Or? Uh, technically, it's all Russian River. The Russian River boundary expanded a little bit south a few years back. So Pinot Hill technically is Russian River. It's also Sonoma Coast, as are both the vineyards in Sebastopol. We label Halberg Ranch as Russian River Valley. I think that that has a little bit more of that kind of red fruit, kind of bright fruit characteristic that we get from Russian River. 
And we label Pinot Hill actually as Sonoma Coast. We really think that it relates much more to being a coastal vineyard. It's in kind of a gap in the mountains, coastal mountains. So we get just get lots and lots of fog, lots of marine influence. So when we were tasting it, that's a new bottling for us. We 2013 was the first vintage that we made from Pinot Hill. So when we were tasting it and kind of talking about where it fit in, kind of in the larger AVA scheme, we all tasted it separately, wrote down our thoughts, and then we kind of came together and uh, opened the ballots and everybody unanimously in the company said Sonoma Coast. So that was just a no-brainer for us. With the dry farming, uh, all your vineyards are dry farm? Yep. And, you know, the past couple of years, it's been, it's been really dry in yeah, it's California. it's been really dry. Um, <laughs> is that dry like, farming. Has that really, like, crushed your production? Uh, you know, it hasn't. 2015, everybody mm. had a lower production. The two vineyards pr- varied pretty wildly from each other. But at Hallberg Ranch, which is a more established vineyard, it's been dry farmed since 2011. We saw lower than expected crop, but only 20% lower. And when you're talking to some of your neighbors who are down 30, 40, 50%, down 20% feels really good. We've noticed that our vines are able to survive with less water. They you know, we're not getting so little rain that we're worried that there's not enough soil moisture. Our vines have a really extensive, really deep and far-reaching root system, and they're able to pull water from the winter rains that are stored in the clay soil. And that's what they're relying on. So, you know, less rain means we're going to have slightly smaller berries. But overall, you know, 2012, 13, 14, we had above normal yields to the point where we were thinning more than we usually do and, and really trying to cut down our production, whereas 2015, we really only thin for quality, not for quantity. You know, Hill, on the other hand, is a little bit more vintage dependent for yields, <laughs> if you will. So 2015, we were down about 60% there. Um, it varied depending on where you were on the hillside, but that was our average, which is tough, but other area, other vineyards in that area were down 60% or even more percent. Wow. It's a newer vineyard. It's not as established. The roots aren't as deep, but we were able to do it without irrigation, and we think it'll be a better wine for that. And are you the only ones doing dry farming in in the area? Uh, We're the only ones that I know of. I, You know, as we have a lot of water issues and there's more water regulation on pumping and groundwater, which is what most irrigation relies on, you know, in our area, more people are turning towards some form of deficit irrigation if they haven't already been practicing that. And when you're irrigating, you know, it's irrigating vineyards really does, takes away the groundwater, but it also puts the water back down that far. It's not completely just depleting. So people are kind of moving towards that, though, as more regulations are being put in place for water use for agriculture. But I I don't know of anybody doing it quite on the scale that we are and with quite the same commitment. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Sure. Um, I just don't know of it in our area. So what does dry farming bring to the wine? I mean, yeah. obviously it's obviously it's good for the earth. Yeah. And, you, know, and you don't have to use water. That's all great. We don't have to use what water. It, we don't pumping What does it bring well. to the bottle? Uh, to the bottle, it brings a few things. So if we're looking at the vine and we're talking about the development of the grapes, we are getting the same flavor ripeness in our grapes as when we were irrigating. But what we saw when we were irrigating, you're prolonging the hang time somewhat artificially because the rest of the vine is kind of done for the season. The days are shorter. We're not having the fog. Our falls are the best time of year because we don't have fog. So the vine is kind of done for the season. What it's doing is actually kind of just letting the fruit hang out and kind of dehydrate the fruit as the flavors develop in the berries. So when we're dry farming, we're getting all the same flavor development but we are getting all that flavor development earlier in the season because the vine is ripening the fruit at the same time as the vine is going through its, you know, annual cycle. And it's saying, okay, it's about time to shut down, you know, shorter days, lower soil moisture, ripen the fruit, let's get, let's get this done. So we're getting all of that flavor earlier in the season. So we're getting lower alcohol because we have a little bit lower sugar accumulation. Uh, We're also getting more acid preserved in the grapes because we're picking a little bit earlier, but we're getting all the flavor. So it's not just acid. And it's not just fruit. Um, we're getting a really nice marriage of the two, which before we were definitely trending on the kind of more, for better or worse, Russian River style. The bigger fruit, the bigger fruit, fruit, jam, yeah, yeah. more plum flavors, yeah. dried and jam fruit flavors. Whereas now we're getting a little bit of the tartar ripe fruit, but more acid. In the and they're wine. still phenolically ripe. And still phenolically ripe. We're getting, yeah, absolutely. We're getting a lot of flavor, but we're also having these other components. We're also seeing other flavors. We're not just getting the fruit. We're not just getting fruit and acid. We're getting 
other layers of earth and spice. And we think that that's really coming from the clay soil that's underneath our topsoil, which is Gold Ridge, which is the prized soil of Sonoma, of Sebastopol, at least, or Pinot. So we're getting all these other flavors coming in. And really, I think one of the biggest markers is a much longer and more complex finish. And to me, um, this is one of the things that I really have learned from Bryce and from the French is a long and complex finish takes a good wine to being a great wine. And you can't have a great wine if you don't have that finish. Organic, biodynamic, any of that? Yeah, so a lot of organic. We are not certified organic. We're currently going through our certification to be sustainable. We did a self-assessment years ago and we said, oh yeah, of course we are. But about for Hallberg Ranch, about a third of the property is being farmed completely organically. If we wanted to get certified, we could, but we don't. And anything that we put in the vineyards, anything that we're using, our vineyard manager, Kirk, says, I'll put it in a pint glass and drink it. Really going long-term, sustainable farming. We want the vineyards to be there in 50 years, 100 years, and we care about the land. We are you know, doing a lot of things like leaving our cover crop every other row. We want to disc every other row to improve the soil tilth, but you want to leave every other row for beneficials. So, well, insects and bugs and, you know, we have a lot of bunnies and gophers yeah. as well. <laughs> but we have it all and we have, you know, a lot of trees for hawks and other predatory birds and that helps with the gophers too. We, I, I would say like we take inspiration from biodynamic. We use some of their practices, but in certain ways, biodynamic is limiting and that you have to follow certain things that just aren't right for our vineyard. Um, we don't need to spread compost on our vineyard. So yeah, but we take the inspiration from biodynamic in the way that we are sustainable looking long-term and trying to adapt to what's given to us instead of create something around us. So you're not dancing under the moonlight. We're not dancing. <laughs> well, you know, every once in a while, it just depends on how many wine, how many bottles we finish. <laughs> Let's talk about the three sites. Yeah. Um, Hulberg Ranch, that was the first one, right? 1999? Yep. yep. Um it was an apple orchard first, It was an right? apple orchard. So why did Bryce decide that this is where I'm going to plant Pinot Noir? Yeah, so mid-90s, well, early 90s, Kirk, the vineyard manager, who we still, still our guy, he kind of started playing around with Pinot and took some cuttings from a few vineyards in Burgundy, brought them back, started kind of playing around. All legally, of course. Of course. <laughs> Statute of limitations is over, so we can openly talk about it. So he kind of started doing this as a little side project. And mid-90s, Bryce kind of got the idea, too. I would like to credit myself with giving him the idea. But he really kind of said, I, I want to do Pinot, Kirk. And Kirk said, great, I've already been experimenting. Uh, let's go find some property. And Hallberg Ranch, which is the historical name of the property, the Hallbergs owned it for hundreds of years, was a great spot. It had the Gold Ridge soil, and it's also physically on what is called the gold ridge and it's this little ridge uh, that gets a lot of fog coming from the south that kind of fills in the russian river from the petaluma wind gap gets it also from directly from the west that blows right over bodega bay um, right into the green valley and then we also get it that enters uh, russian river valley further up north so all of this fog converges on the gold ridge so these really great nighttime cooling patterns which is a hallmark of Russian River, but we just kind of get this extra layer so it burns off a little bit later in the day. The Gold Ridge soil is prized because it's well draining. These are also gentle hills, so we're getting, you know, the diversity of flavors that comes from planting on hillsides, but it's also not super, super steep. Our other vineyards are pretty steep. So it's just a really fantastic property, and it was also big. It's 110 acres plantable, and what was it tough converting over from an apple orchard it, to? A, I it, mean, it sounds it like that sounds like there's some serious physical farming that needed to yeah, happen. Yeah, it took some time. The first name of the company was Apple a Day, and that was a joke about how many trees we were ripping out. But it, it took some time. It took about a year till we could start planting vines to even just clear out enough of the apples. Before it was apples, the Halbergs had been planting, had been growing Zinfandel, and then Prohibition was enacted, and like many people in the area, ripped out their vines and planted apples. The Halbergs, so this was mid-90s, Bryce and Kirk said, Don and Marsha, we want to buy your land, and they said, no, not right now. Bryce said, we'll match any offer, we'll do whatever it takes, and they just said, no, not right now. And in 1999, uh, they said, okay, we'll sell you, we'll sell it to you now. And there were some other big players that were looking to buy it, and Bryce said he'd match any offer. And ultimately, he came just shy of it, 
it's still a record for Sonoma County land at the oh, time. Oh, really? And the reason that they sold to him was because he was going to keep their foreman, Mr. Temple, in his house and keep the liquid amber trees up their driveway. And that was really important to them that those things happened. And clinched the deal. And that, yeah, so that, that put us over the edge. And um, Kirk had also, Kirk is a farmer, and he had created a really uh, good relationship with them over five years of knocking on their door and saying, are you ready to sell yet? Are you ready to sell yet? In the mid-90s, so at the same time as they found Halberg Ranch, they also found this site in Annapolis, which is far northwest of Sonoma County, not Maryland. But far, far northwest in Sonoma County, you know, the dark side of the moon. We call it Ellenbach because driving out there is like going to hell and back. So Ellenbach Vineyard turned into William Wesley. And we, Bryce purchased that, gave it to my brother and just kind of left it as land until he started the partnership with Obear, the one day in his life that he ever had money, which was the day he sold Sonoma Dreher. And he said, okay, Victor, uh, go up there and plant it. Obear and I are going to make this happen. So that's how William Wesley came about. It was kind of in that same exploration of Pinot land, but it was kind of as like a little side thing and, you know, we'll buy it for us and our family and see if, you know, we ever need it for a vineyard or, you know, whatever it's going to be. And uh, it just kind of all came together at the same time that uh, we were able to start planting both and ultimately buy out O'Bear and Rebel William Wesley into the Emeritus portfolio. And what about Pinot Hill? Pinot Hill's uh, our newest baby. So we purchased Pinot Hill in 2008. It was a llama farm. And uh, <laughs> you, you don't take the easy path, do you? No, <laughs> no. Uh, when you plant your own vineyard, you make your own mistakes instead of inheriting somebody else's. True. And it's a little bit easier to stomach your own mistakes than somebody else's. So we go that way. And, you know, at the heart of it, we're all just micromanagers. And we all just like to make sure that we're doing everything our way. So planting our own vineyards is really the only way we're going to do it. So that was a little bit easier to convert to a vineyard from a llama farm. It was just putting in the vines. Sure. <laughs> Less time. And uh, so that was planted in 08. And 2013 is the first bottling from it. Oh, no kidding. First yeah, first so it's, uh, it's a new guy for us. Cool. It's really good. Anything special going on in the uh, vinification process that you guys are doing? Anything different? The biggest thing that we're doing different is buying our own trees for our barrels. Um, I would say we really have the hands-off winemaking approach, pretty gentle, cold soak, gentle fermentation, all gravity fed. We use the Portman's gravity flow, which is a forklift. Uh, and, um, everything is its not standard. It's not formulaic. It, it really is Nicholas, our winemaker, um, looking at each lot individually. But grand picture, nothing out of the ordinary except um, our barrels. Yeah, Bryce and Nicholas, our winemaker. Nicholas is actually just there right now at the auction for the trees and was purchasing some trees with our all, forester. All French. All French oak, yep. And um, this is the same forester that Bryce has been working with for close to 40 years now. Forester will age the staves in his yard for about three years and then ship the staves to the Coopers. Coopers will make the barrel star specifications and then send them off to us. So we're really, like I said, micromanaging, <laughs> really making sure we're getting the oak that we want. But yeah, everything else is just very gentle, very natural style of winemaking. With, with the kind of gentle, natural style of winemaking, what does the oak bring to, to the wine? Yeah, the oak brings, uh, depending on the wine, some of our wines have more new oak than others, but definitely a great aging vessel. The reason that we do a three-year air seasoning is to really leach out a lot of those really intense flavors. So it's a little bit more of a gentle flavoring. Oak, Nicholas, this is my favorite thing that he says, oak is like um, salt. It's an enhancement, but it shouldn't be the flavor. Right. So, I mean, we're not eating potato chips, right? So we, we want it to be the complement and to enhance all the other flavors and, and make the wine better, but we don't want it to be what you taste. Before we taste, tell me one more. I got one more question yeah. for you. Where did the name come from? Oh, yeah. Emeritus. Old men. So Bryce left Sonoma Chair. Well, he was told to leave. And pretty much, you know, most of the team came with him. He had you know, taken a lot of the same people to start developing the vineyard and kind of go on this path. So, you know, the finance guy, employee zero was the same at both Sonoma Couture and Emeritus, and she runs everything. Don't tell Bryce. And, you know, it's it's really the same team. The only person who was different was the winemaker. And when we started making wine, that was Don Blackburn. And he has since passed away. And Nicholas, our winemaker, now is his assistant. So we've really had the same winemaking team since we started Emeritus, but it was a different team than at Sonoma Couture. But really, everybody had been together for a long time, and Bryce jokingly dubbed them the 
emeritus team because they were kind of old, semi-retired, couldn't quite give it up, had like one more project left in them. And when it came time to name the winery, he was like, well, obviously we're just going to name it emeritus. That makes sense. It's so. nice to have that out there because <laughs> sometimes coming up with a name is a really difficult thing to do. Oh, and it definitely can He had be. it put in front of him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, let's say some wine. Yeah. So this is the 2013 Pinot Hill. And this we just released in this past October. So it's, oh, that's it's pretty. been about six months. Yeah. And like I said, this is the inaugural vintage from the vineyard. Planted in 08. So, you know, we had it it's a few years old. but. So tell me about the wine. Well, taste it and you tell me. Put me on the spot, huh? <laughs> I told you about the vineyard. You can tell me about the wine. I don't like to tell people what to taste. So, it's um, the fruits there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's this is Russian River. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is really, it's not in the Petaluma wind gap, but it's in the same kind of um, gap area. A and, great body and yeah. lovely texture, and there's a little of that earthiness to it. There definitely is. And so this gets very little sun exposure. The clusters of Pinot are, can fit in just like the little palm of your hand. They're so tiny. It's a pretty steep hill. It's about 20 to 30% grades, 30 acres, just big... Uh, Big elevation change in those 30 acres. And so lots and lots of fog. It comes in around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and the whole vineyard's pretty much covered by about 4 o'clock. And it doesn't burn off till about 11 plus in the morning, 11 or later. So very little sun exposure. This is the only vineyard we'll pick after sunrise because it's still so cold there. <laughs> the grapes will stay cold, you know, into the morning, whereas our other vineyards, once the sun uh, is out the grapes will warm up really quickly and we'll stop harvesting. And what's the production on the Pinot Hill roughly? I mean, uh, I know you're, five you're, to six hundred cases. I mean, 2015 we'll get like 300, but you know, on a good year. And, ex- and not available in the Chicago market, but is available through like the website? Yep, or? yep of course. So it's online, uh, yep, from the winery. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, we don't distribute it at all. It's just too small production. And the price? 55. 55 retail. Yep. Yeah, it's delicious. It's it's not afraid to be California. It's not no. trying to be Burgundy. It's nothing that we it's, do is it's, trying it's, to be Burgundy. We just take the best of the old world methods with our amazing climate in California. People like to live in California because the weather is so great. <laughs> we don't have to worry about hail. <laughs> yeah, that's that's delicious wine. Very nice. Well, thank you. All right, so this is the Halberg Ranch, another 2013. A little more delicate color on this wine, huh? Yeah, and this wine, we definitely, or the vineyard, I should say, we definitely get more sun exposure, but we we still have a lot of the same fog. Uh, It just burns off earlier in the morning and rolls back in later in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also a little bit gentler slopes, 15 degree slopes versus like 30, and more clone diversity. We have 11 clones planted at Halberg, where we have seven uh, planted at Pinot Hill. Mm. And a couple of those are the suitcase clones that Kirk brought back. So (laughs) It's a little shyer on the nose, Mm. but lush. The texture's really lush. Good acidity. Yeah. um, Halberg just has a little bit more roundness and like voluptuousness to it. Yeah. The Halberg is... uh, Rounder, yeah. lusher. Yeah, it's got a little bit more voluptuous. Than a, yep, exactly. And I think that just comes, you know, the grapes get a little bit more sugar. The t- you know the skins get a little bit thicker. It's just a little bit more Russian River kind of fruit. Wow, both great wines. Both scream for food, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, and with anything, I mean, Halver Ranch is what we distribute, but you know. We're in steakhouses, Italian restaurants, French, sushi. I mean, can really go with anything. And I have so many people who, you know, oh, I don't really like red wine, or I'm not, I'm not really a Pinot fan. And you pour them Halberg, and How it's like, How can you not oh. be a Pinot fan? What are you talking about? You're not a <laughs> yeah. Pinot fan. It's because they haven't tasted good Pinot. Well, you, but, know, you know, there was that movie they made a while back. That was <laughs> Sideways not, o- back, yeah. not only, not only, uh, did it crush the Merlot market? It really did. It was yes. responsible for a lot of really bad people being made. It, uh, yes, and it's called the sideways effect in the industry. Like it bumped I mean, Pinot up in sales a lot, and it kind of crushed Merlot. But but I mean, but yeah, then everybody wanted everyone was Pinot. making Pinot Noir, and Pinot Noir. Everyone shouldn't be making Pinot <laughs> no, Noir. It shouldn't true. be made everywhere. It should it's, not be made everywhere. It, um, it requires a very particular well. For the style that I like, I guess maybe I'm being too elitist. Are these wines in the style that you like, and why? What about them? Yeah, they are. I, I, you know, I like, I like all wines. Um, I can appreciate all styles. You know, give it to me, and I'm sure I'll be happy. But if I'm really, you know, collecting my own or 
you know, buying for uh, me and my fiance to have dinner to bring to a friend's house or something like that. I do tend to like, let's see, so my fiance really likes much more bolder fruit and I prefer a little bit lighter style Pinot. Um, so I like these, I like this style because it is ripe. They're, the grapes are ripe. The fruit is there. It is just very appealing but there's also this really nice balance with the acid makes it easier to eat food with but also you know at the end of the day you just want a wine that's enjoyable and that has complexity and depth and flavors and every time you taste it you get something different and these wines totally have that they reflect where they're from they reflect the vintage they reflect the vineyard they reflect the people and you know what else can you ask for so the first vintage was 05 how are how are the wines from those earlier vintages, 05 onwards, tasting? I mean, yeah. we're, not, we're not talking about that long, but, you know, how yeah. are the 05s tasting now? Um, depends on the wine. So at that time, we weren't making Pinot Hill, but we were making the William Wesley. Uh, that wine can age. That wine is marked by its tannins. It's a little bit higher alcohol. It's above the fog line, so it gets a little bit riper. So that wine can age. That's tasting great. The other night... Let's see, about three weeks ago, celebrating um, an engagement with a friend. We had a Magnum of 09 Hallberg. Just phenomenal. Just phenomenal. You know, before that, let's see, I had an 08 Hallberg last fall. It was quite good, but we're drinking it and we were like, yeah, we should probably clean out what we've got. Time to go. Yeah. It was, yeah, were vintage time. dependence. Yeah. So yeah. what we've kind of seen, we did actually a, a big vertical tasting of Hallberg earlier this year and really kind of 2010 was a tipping point some people really liked the 2010s and some people felt they were too old I guess 2009 kind of fell into that too so I was in the category where I really liked the 9 and 10 um, and then the 11 12 and 13 were all kind of like yeah drink or hold like it could really go depends your taste more than anything so yeah I, I think Hallberg is definitely more in this than the style of drink within five years of harvest um it's not it's not the kind of wine that uh ages for 20 years that's just what it is it's okay yeah let's, it's okay. let's drink some wine it's let's just drink <laughs> it it's delicious we talked about the production on Pinot hill yeah. 500 cases and the price uh talk, talk to me about the production yeah. on this and the price halberg is around 8,000 cases and it's 42 bottle retail okay so fairly available yeah and... yeah pretty available we're in about uh, 18 or 20 markets and around the country so um we have a pretty good distribution network and that's super nice. expensive in the sweet spot you know in the, yeah, on the high nice end of not expensive yeah exactly right it's and i think more than anything, it's a, it's a good value. I associate a lot of value with wine. You can have a really fantastic wine, but if it's $500 a bottle, is that really worth it? When you can have a really fantastic wine at $60 a bottle? Right. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. So I, I do associate a lot of value with wine. And for me, it's always a value proposition with everything else in the world, right? Is that worth it? And in terms of what else is out there for that price, I think this is definitely great, great value. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll tell you, if you're a fan of Russian River Pinot Noir, the uh, Emeritus Pinots are something you ought to check out. Uh, they're really delicious. They're, they're not ashamed to be from the Russian River. Yeah. So, Mari Jones, president of fun at Emeritus Vineyards, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, John. It's been wonderful. For John's tasting notes on the wines from this episode, go to www.thehonestpourpod.com. Make sure you catch every episode by subscribing to The Honest Pour with John Lennart at iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Play Store. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook at The Honest Pour with John Lennart and follow us on Twitter at The Honest Pour. This has been The Honest Pour with John Lennart. Music by Kevin McLeod. 